do you remember about your goals for the first sketch fest? Oh, uh, wow, yeah. So our goals for the first sketch fest were really simple. We just wanted to not lose money. We wanted to, because we were six groups that had all met in the process of trying to perform at different places in San Francisco and finding that even though there's like a very rich comedy history to San Francisco, at the particular time that we were performing sketch, there just weren't places to perform uh, that kind of comedy. You either had to rent a theater and be, you know, a production company or, or, or a theatrical company of some kind or do comedy clubs, which isn't necessarily conducive to, yeah. <laughs> in particular, sketch when there's like no backstage to change your weird wig or whatever it is that you have. So we just uh, were trying to find an opportunity to kind of do a set where we, you know, we did have a 45 minute set that we were trying to put out into the world, and we had met these great other sketch groups who were experiencing the same thing. So we very ambitiously, having had no experience doing this kind of thing before. Uh, reached out to these other groups and said, you know, if we do this together and we share, we can sort of co-headline and everybody can get a chance to perform with everybody else a couple of times, then your audience will see already our audience and hopefully we'll sort of build this bigger sketch community audience. Um, cause they all were very different groups from one another. Their styles were really different. It was so, and they said, uh, that they would do it. And so we rented this little theater, um, just off Union Square and I think it was like 70 or 80 seats, just a little itty bitty, but still super stressful. Like, how are we going to, you know, we're doing, I think we did, certainly did Friday, Saturday shows. I feel like maybe we did Thursday, Sunday. Now I can't remember. My partner's would probably remember better than, than I. For some reason, I just start spacing out on things with numbers. Um, but but we ended up selling out like every show. I think there was one show we didn't sell out. <laughs> and, um, the uh, guy who managed the theater um, was like, he saw us that night and said like, you sold out again? And we we're like, no. And he goes, slowing down. And then we proceeded to sell out the rest of the festival. So even now, sometimes, when uh, something does really well, but it doesn't completely sell out, we'll go slowing down to each other as a joke. Uh, but so yeah, we just wanted to not fail um, in all of the ways that failure was possible. We didn't want to you know, lose money. We didn't want to make fools of ourselves uh, artistically. Uh, we wanted to do right by the people that we were you know, uh, doing the festival with. And um, and we ended up getting a ton of press coverage, which is really nice. And that's one thing that's always been true for us. And I think the arts in San Francisco as a whole, like as much as other things have changed, I think whatever iteration of press exists, uh, there's still an interest in, you know, sort of um, helping to guide people towards artistic ventures that aren't necessarily super commercial. You know, so uh, yeah, so I feel like we reached all of our goals, certainly enough to do a second year. Um, but that was, that was, it was pretty simple, what we were looking for. Do you remember, like, one of the ones that just came out of your life? You don't think it's too much Aside from, let's say, breaking the scene. Right. Like, oh, you permanent debt or something. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I don't, I don't know that there was any, like, one thing, um, if it wasn't to break even. And I think we were prepared to lose money, but I, we were certainly afraid to lose money, even if we were prepared for it. Um, I think if I, project back now and try to assign something, like for me personally, not for, I can't speak for David Owen and Cole Stratton, my partners, but um, just making their, their, the other groups laugh because we respected them so much, um, and, and not to single out anybody, but I guess to single out somebody. But um, our friends Casper Hauser, who are one of the only groups that are still together, um, our group doesn't perform together anymore, most of them don't. One of them very recently reunited, I think, just for this festival. But there has been a consistency to Casper Hauser through all through the 18 years that we've existed as a festival. And they are absolutely brilliant and so unique and so strange and wonderful and funny. So forging friendships with those guys and um, making them laugh was probably a goal of mine. Even if I wasn't thinking of it that way, it was like, it felt so good to feel like we had the respect of this group that we so admired. So you, you actually mentioned the press and the art scene and, and stuff in San Francisco has changed considerably since. What do you think the biggest change in Sketchfest has impacted the growth? 
the the variety has is I mean that that obviously works hand in hand with the fact that it's grown so much, but definitely the fact that we have kept our name SF Sketchfest because that's how we began, and that's certainly oh my God even year two we didn't we had improv, so uh, we very very quickly branched out, but we felt like we had worked so hard to establish a brand uh, that we kept the name. So. It's still funny when we interact with people who have no idea what we do or are not into comedy at all. And, you know, you meet somebody and try to explain that you do this festival and you say it's SF Sketch Fest. And so if, if they even understand the sketch part of it, the assumption is then like, oh, so you just do a bunch of sketch comedy stuff. And then we have to go, no, the sketch part is actually now, sadly, one of the maybe smaller categories because there just isn't as much sketch that's known and beloved and sells out huge theaters and stuff. That's not exactly where comedy is right now, which isn't to say there isn't great sketch happening. There absolutely is. Uh, and there are shows like Ian Peel, not on anymore, but you know, there are shows that still uh, absolutely showcase how special sketch is. But you know, now we have so many podcasts, so much stand-up, so many panels, music shows, variety shows. Um, debates, game shows, like it's just expanded out so much that it is sort of funny that our name is, is still SF Sketchfest and will always be SF Sketchfest. Did you ever hesitate to incorporate all those other groups? That's a good question. Um, I think there were, I think we, I think we had longer conversations about things we wanted to bring uh, earlier on in the early years. I think we did. I don't know that we ever decided not to bring something because we just felt like it wasn't us enough. Maybe like I mean, we still sometimes have, have conversations about, you know, directors that we love who just really just do drama. <laughs> and we're like, mm, I don't know if we're going to be able to squeeze this into something <laughs> comedy related. But in general now, um, we, we tend to pursue things without as much concern. But yeah, I do think that there were times where one of us would say, like, I really love this band. What if they're comedy nerds? Wouldn't it be fun if we could get them to do something? Or, you know, yes, I love this, uh, TV show, but we don't, why would we do something with a TV show or a sketch, you know, so there, there's, it's, it's widened out, but, and then there's less of that, but yeah, I do think that there was more conversation like that. Or do you try to encourage more of that kind of new media stuff now to participate, or would you say, just see it from us, or? I think it's a combination of all of that stuff. I mean, I do think that, it, it, realistically, um, we don't, I, I don't know that we are living that much in the kind of YouTube of it all. I mean, I absolutely, uh, all due respect to that world, by and large, it is a totally foreign entity to me. Like, I wouldn't, and there are things we've tried to do that we know have massive followings, and we can't sell tickets. So somehow, however that information is being disseminated, we're not necessarily hitting those demographics when we try to get the word out. I remember we did a, this is, I, did, this is, this, I don't mean this to sound like, no, oh, we couldn't sell tickets. But we had a, we thought, we did a Dragon Ball Z thing, um, a VR thing even, yeah. a couple of years ago, uh, because Chris Sabat, who is uh, Vegeta, is a very close friend of mine, and we were so excited to bring him out, and it, it's, he's, it's so, it, like, there's so much comedy to it, such high energy, the people who do it are such great improvisers. So we had this whole thing set up in this theater, and we didn't sell it out. Um, and that is one of the most popular things in the world. So it's one of those things where, like, how are we not... So there are things that are that are out in the world that we don't necessarily have the the knowledge to really tap into, um, and I think that has grown over time. But you know, the Dragon Ball Z thing was only a couple of years ago, so it just goes to show, like somehow we just didn't get the right people. You know, I'm sure it was a thing where after it happened and they put out the VR thing, people were like, they were in San Francisco, you know? Yeah, I, I, yeah, I, I always look at those. Yeah. Oh, well, we were cool before you knew it. Yeah, like, yeah. Out, yeah, but yeah. But, um, but as somebody who also has been in the Frickers, you know, you know, well, because you, have, you do go to Comic Cons for I do, I do, yeah. So this comedy stuff, like, mm -hmm. do you find yourself code switching, like, in terms of dealing with people? Yeah. And, That's a good question. Um, I think maybe I worried about that more when I, when things started to kind of diverge a little bit in terms of what worlds I was in. I think one of my goals has kind of been to sort of bring everything back together. Um, I, 
in part just because I'm like, well, I like it. I like that. Like, I, now I'm in a place in my career where I'm pretty proud of everything that I get to be a part of. And so I do sort of hope that if somebody, if I think something's great that I was lucky enough to be a part of, that perhaps somebody who only knows about that might also like these other things that while they may not be cartoons or they may not be, you know, straight comedy, that there's kind of, there. I hope that like whatever it is that I see in it, maybe more people will see as well. Um, so yeah, I don't, I don't feel like I have to do that so much. It, that might be more true if I were, you know, a true crime podcaster or something, which there's every possibility that that will end up happening at some point because that is something I care about. But I would not, I would not do what, uh, the darling and wonderful, my favorite murder girls do, which is they have merged those two things extremely successfully and effectively. But I would, I don't feel like I could do that. There are certain things that I think I would have a hard time bringing the kind of comedy into. Um, so, but as it happens, at this point, things I'm doing kind of work together, you know, or if I were like on a draw, like a serious drama that like was just super hard hitting, like Homeland, you know what I mean? If I were on like a Homeland, it would be, it would be would hard, you know what I mean? <laughs> like I in a heartbeat. Yeah, well, I appreciate that. But yeah, I think that would be hard for me to not feel like this audience deserves this version of me and this version alone is what they expect or want. And they don't care about that other stuff, you know. It's nice having your own podcast where you're like, hey, you know what? Like, this is going to be whatever. Yes, it is. And I think that's absolutely. And I think you hit the nail on the head because that is what is true, I think, for everybody who has a podcast is that they feel like they have a thing that most of the time is untouched by anybody unless, you know, unless you're very into advertisers to the point where you would like, you know, sort of change your content to satisfy them. But I don't know a lot of podcasters who are that worried about it, um, that it is a feeling of kind of like, this is me, this is, no one else really has to put their hands on it, I don't have to get notes back from anybody on this, this is just, you know, a little more pure form of however I want to express myself at any given time. I think that is one of the reasons that their, you know, podcasts show no sign of, you know, disappearing or reducing in number. Touching on that more, actually, uh, you were very open in yours, and I, I find it amazing and refreshing, and, you know, it's like... Um, yeah, I, I've had, I think the hardest thing, I've said this before, but the hardest thing for me has actually been just the recognition that someone could come up to me and feel like they knew me and had a relationship with me and, and that it's can't, that it, in that moment it can't be mutual, that I have no idea, I, I don't know enough about this other person's life to have that sense of familiarity. And I think that that, um, coming as a fan to other things, uh, I think that would be really hard. Like if I, you know, even just knowing someone's music and having it deeply affect you or someone's poetry or someone's writing or whatever that might be, it's hard to want to have a personal connection to someone who's created this thing and not have the time to be like, here's all the reasons why you should also like me because I agree with it. Like, and so that, that, uh, that I think is, has been hard for me. In terms of being open or giving stuff away, I think, um, I don't, I don't, I don't feel like I am, and maybe, maybe you, the person who is this person never knows that they are. I don't feel like I'm an oversharer in the sense of like needing attention. Um, I think I just feel like the longer I have done the podcast and spoken to other people who have also ended up being really open, the more I just feel that it sort of humanizes everyone, even if it's somebody you haven't met and you're just sitting across from on a bus. I think when there's a sense out there and not, and not in an abusive like online way where people are trolling each other or, you know, that kind of shit, like, the accessibility goes both ways and there's some really awful stuff that happens through that. I'm not particularly accessible on social media. Like that's not where I choose to sort of put myself because it, I don't have any interest in, in inviting that kind of negativity back. But I think if it is something where, you know, you sort of um, realize that, you know, there's a lot going on in anyone's life and mind that maybe you'll be more compassionate, you know, the next time somebody does something or you, you know, sort of assume like, well, that person's clearly got it together, so why would they say that other than that they're mean, 
you know, I don't know. So that doesn't, yeah, that doesn't, I mean, <laughs> there may come a time where I'm like, I can't believe I shared all of that stuff. But I, but so far, um, I never felt like, oh shit, that was a mistake, you know? Other people seem to respond to it. You know, like, uh, do you come in with like those kind of talking points? Or like when you have a guest and you're like, hey, these are the things I want to talk about, it just seems more of a... I ne I really don't. Well, like, I so rarely <laughs> do. Yeah, I so rarely do because so many of the people I don't know well enough, and um, I guess I don't. Uh, I certainly don't want to say something that you know puts someone off. And I I do say like if you end up saying something that you don't feel comfortable having said later, we can edit it out. It is so rare that that someone says I regret saying something. Please take that out. Very very rare. Uh, but I don't necessarily. Yeah, I don't know. I would, I mean, I, maybe it's, maybe I'm just lazy, but I, I don't, um, I kind of do like to think of it as like, this is a person that you, you've just been introduced to at a party or whatever and just come in completely blank. I don't know where they're from. I don't know. And if it's somebody that I'm already friends with, then that energy, it's just whatever level of recognition and, and, and knowledge we have of each other going in is organic. That there isn't like a bunch of research that's been done in either direction, you know, yeah. um, or it's laziness. I don't know, but okay, yeah. Say okay. Thank you, thank you. Um, so, what podcast do you listen to? I listen to almost zero comedy podcasts um, for no other reason than that I'm surrounded by. I'm very okay. fortunate to be, but I always feel bad because a lot of my friends do listen to each other's podcasts, and yeah, and 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 I I sort of. I mean, I love that, but whatever my escapism, I do, I do think of podcasts as, as, as escapist in terms of not that I have this horrible life. I absolutely love what I do for a living. Um, and I love my friendships and I love doing other people's podcasts that are comedy. But, um, and I, I said this from the beginning too, like the first podcast that I was ever aware of and certainly the first one I probably ever appeared on was Jimmy Pardo's. And when I, started listening to his podcast very quickly, I was frustrated. I was like, but I want to, but I, why can't I say something back? I have thoughts on this. And I know that that's the thing that people kind of push up against all the time on podcasts. And I just understand that. I absolutely understand that. If I'm listening to something that is far, farther removed from me, it's not someone I know, it's maybe not a topic I know a ton about or what have you, then it, it, it it, I, I guess it bothers me less, and I can sort of just let it wash over me rather than feeling, yeah. you know, like this about it. Um, so yeah, I do listen to a lot of like, you know, crime stuff and and legal stuff that you know where those two things meet with like undisclosed. I'm a huge fan of undisclosed. I love that they get into just like super wonk, like legal wonk, like that they're just completely like, you know. We're gonna give you all of this, and if it's if it's for you, great. And if you find it totally boring and just you want, you know, something that's just like who done it, then you can have that too somewhere else. Um, but I uh, I listen to, I mean, you know, there's a lot of stuff that that I listen to that a lot of people listen to. Like I always listen to Episode American Life. I always listen to Radio Lab. Um, I really like. Uh, uh, Jad's side project, More Perfect, um, about lo the law and the Constitution. Um, I love and disclose. I uh, am a huge fan of Bob Ruff, even though stylistically we're very, very different. Um, I very quickly became such a fan of his passion for, you know, I, I don't, like he is he is this the story of somebody who was a listener who wanted to start a podcast about something he was into. And then it completely changed his life. He ended up quitting his job, and now he's just going out and trying to fight for people who are falsely imprisoned. Like his whole life did a 180, and I, I, I'm so fascinated by that, you know. So, um, so it's really a, a lot of stuff like that, and uh, and not so much, you know, the the fun stuff. And it, that same is true for television. Of all the characters you played, which one do you like and why? Oh, well, the character I, well, I mean, I, uh, from Cora, from Legend of Cora, because she is, uh, deeply, was deeply flawed, but also, you know, like, had to come to terms with those things and, and survived through horrible stuff and, and, uh, you know, was a superhero. It's hard not to admire the, the person who has magical powers. 
the most. <laughs> so it's not really even a contest. Uh, what's your most unique fan encounter? Probably related to Cora. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, not a bad way. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the 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 ones that are the most surprising to me are just the ones that I don't expect to be recognized in some kind of environment. I mean, I, the, the the most the thing that crept into my mind the quickest is not that unique. It's just that I was on a road trip and was it, it, like ran out in the pouring rain at like 10:30 at night in the middle of nowhere on the way to probably Arizona where there's a lot of kind of dead space between the two places. And uh, and I was in a gas station, like, getting, you know, a snack or whatever, and there was only one other person there. And this girl came up to me and said, I I'm so sorry to bother you. And I seriously thought she was going to say, like, I was here first, or, like, I thought, yeah. you know, you're just, it was you like, this was like a, like, yeah, cheetos. everybody's, like, fighting for survival <laughs> on in the middle of the desert, you know, on during a rainstorm. And she was like, are you on your the worst? And I was like, this is very unexpected. Like, it just was not a time I would have ever expected to be recognized by the only other person in that place. Um, and she was like, I gotta go tell my mom. She's still in the car, but she loves the show. So that was, that was the one that kind of popped into my brain because it was the most recent sort of like, boy, I, I can't believe, you know, yeah, I can't believe that just happened. Yeah, yeah. I'm really Do you have a friend in your life? Uh, I mean, definitely, I've never had a mentor. I always, um, I was, I'm, I, whenever that term was used in like a, 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 a an actual way in which I felt like someone, they, that they, they understood as mentee and mentor, I was like, I don't know how, what that conversation looks like when you're like, will you be my official mentor? May I refer to you as my mentor? Like that just never was, uh, something I even thought was possible, I guess, for me. It seemed very professional. It seemed like you get a mentor when you're a philosophy major and your professor is not just your advisor, but also your mentor. He's, you know, you guys have this arrangement where this person or she says this and then you follow what she says. So I've never had, I certainly have never had anything official. Um, I do feel like, uh, I've, I'm, and I don't know that I've had the relationship with someone where I would be the, the one person that they would sort of take the call from. You know, I don't know that there's been that kind of situation. I would say that Bruce McCullough, uh, from Kids in the Hall is one of my dearest friends, but is also somebody who, um, I feel like I, I, I mean, I certainly admire him. Um, I admire all the work that he's done. I admire his relationship with his family, where, how he balances his work with his personal life and, and doesn't, let one overtake the other, um, and is and he's definitely somebody that you know I I would feel comfortable like going to about anything. So he is probably the closest thing I can think of to that. But also not somebody that I'm like, oh my mentor. Like he's a friend. You know he talks to me about stuff too. So it's not really it's that. Like one mystery, right? Yeah, it's, yeah. All right. So broadly, what inspires you? What inspires me? Uh, I would say other people's joy in things that they're doing. Um, it was wildly inspiring to me. Uh, I am inspired by uh, the... I'm inspired by... <laughs> I'm inspired by this sort of over... Mm, I don't know how to explain this, actually. I've never thought about it before. But like, if I'm in a place that's different and that I feel outside of, whether I'm visiting another city or another community or whatever, and I can sort of see the way it works and the way it's successful, um, even if that's just like, you know, Golden Gate Park or I, I don't know. The, yeah. I get excited about like something that has come together that clearly a lot of people have to participate in to make it work. I think that's really inspiring. Um, anything that like reminds me that there are really positive things about being a human being. <laughs> Uh, are very inspiring because we spend so much time talking about, you know, how broken we are as a race and like that's all true and it absolutely should be discussed or, you know, obviously no, ignorance is not bliss. Um, but I think I'm, I am a huge fan of trying to really, really balance that generously, you know. Thank you. Haha. 
Oh, I Maybe mean. Stubbing your toes. Yeah. Really <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I do stub my toes all the time. I mean, I guess I do feel good. I mean, I, I get frustrated about, I try not to get frustrated about the smaller things, but there's no question that I absolutely do. Um, I, yeah, I mean, I, I, I get frustrated uh, with my, I, I get, <laughs> it's this sort of self-fulfilling prophecy where like I get frustrated by my own frustration. I get frustrated by a, like an impatience, you know, um, the, the frustration. It's, it's all stuff that sort of is very, tied to, you know, like needing to meditate more or just whatever that meditation looks like for each person. Um, like, but then also beating yourself up for not relaxing better. Like just getting into that cycle is very frustrating. My next question is, how do you relax? <laughs> no, I think you're just, you have a good flow of questions that naturally the answers will lead into the next. Uh, I very much enjoy um, riding my bike. Uh, I find that to be extremely relaxing. Um, I am more of a doer where relaxation is concerned. Like I'd like to be hiking or be on a bike or like I guess physical activity is good for me because it is a way to sort of check out and have to focus on something else. Um, and then the same way I think meditation works like thoughts still come in and out, but they don't have the same kind of power that they do when all you're doing is thinking about or trying to solve a problem. So I've gotten a, a lot of uh, relief, I think, from from that kind of physical activity. I'm sure I got that from my dad, because I think he's very, very similar in that way. Um, so that's, a, that's definitely one. And yeah, I mean, but also like totally vegging out and watching things is, I mean, I can't, I'm not one of those people that's like, I don't know, I don't watch a lot of television. I tend to just read books, you know, like that's absolutely not true. I love TV. I, there's, I'm very picky about what I watch, but um, there's never a point at which I'm like, this is a great show, but I'm probably watching too much TV. Like I, I just can't, I would love to say that I'm, that I'm more of an intellectual than that, but I'm, if it's great, like give me as much of it as possible. How do you define personal success now and how that changed from maybe earlier in your career when you were younger? Yeah. Um, I don't, I, I don't know what I would have defined personal success as when I was younger, other than that, um, I was raised by parents who were very, um, comfortable with what they did for a living and were very proud of it and were not making money in any kind of, like, super capitalist way. But, so my dad, in terms of role models and mentors, I guess my dad is also a, a huge one for me because he had primary custody of me and really, you know, was my my prime kind of person who was raising me, I guess. And uh, and he was really like just loved his job. He loved teaching. He loved writing, um, writing and writing. Uh, and so I look at him as a person who's had tremendous personal success. But, you know, he was working on a public school teacher's salary. So that, uh, so I don't know that I've ever considered like overall personal success being about money. When I got into show business, that I really had to sort of wrestle with that more because it absolutely is something that kind of confronts you all the time. Like the business is very good at, um, nurturing dreams and making things possible and sort of letting the kid in you feel rewarded, which is wonderful, but it also is very good at, you know, putting all of your insecurities right in front of you all the time and and comparing you or allowing you or asking you to compare yourself to other people and the ways that the industry defines success can be very different than an individual defines success. So that's that's definitely important to me is to sort of <clears throat> look around and go, you know, you, you the definition of a personal, personal success has to be independent of what somebody else tells you, or it's not real, you know. Yeah, yeah. Um, I think I, yeah. I mean, I think that I think I would say like feeling really good about what it is that you're doing, whatever that is. Um, feeling very grateful. I think if you feel grateful that you get to do what you do. Surely that's a, a, an indicator that you're successful, you know, personally successful. Um, 
Uh, absolutely, if you can, you know, whatever roof you have over you, if you're able to um, sustain that. That's just a basic, fundamental sort of like, thank God I can do that, you know. Um, those are those are kind of the main things. And that you have time to to not just be one person, you know, that you sort of have time to be all versions of yourself is also, because a lot of people don't have that luxury, you know. Even if they love what they do, they may not be personally successful in their minds in the sense that they don't get to see their kids enough or whatever. So always trying to figure out those balances, I think. It's tough. <laughs> Um, growing up, who's your favorite fictional character? Oh man, so there are so many. Uh, every, yeah, I mean, I definitely made absolutely no uh, secret that I loved Anne of Green Gables, like many other young women. Um, I very much connected with the idea of like you know being very imaginative, being alone a lot, um, feeling like you don't fit in. All of the stuff that when you're little you feel like you're the only one who's like that and then as you get older you're like, oh we all were doing that? In our own little corners? How adorable. Uh, other fictional characters, um, yeah, I mean that's, that, that, I think the, that, pers that sort of literary character is kind of the, the biggest one for me that, that I that kind of still return to over and over again. Um, all the characters in like A Wrinkle in Time, I was felt a lot of affection towards. Uh, yeah, like the, I mean, yeah, mostly book book stuff, I guess. I'm trying to think if there's like, you know, a movie or a TV character that I that I really loved coming back to time and again, and I don't know that 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 there is one. So my last question is, what is anything you wish you had more time for? Oh yeah, uh, one thing I wish I had more time for is um, uh, like communicating with people that I care about who aren't nearby. Um, I am, I feel like I, I don't, I feel like I spend so much time catching up on like on emails and stuff and working online that I am not great at writing letters anymore. Uh, and I'm also, we now live in a world in which people rarely speak on the phone <laughs> for, for whatever reason. So I don't just like pick up the phone and call my old, you know, girlfriend or something. I just don't find myself doing that, nor is that happening for me very often. So I think that, you know, the sort of like, um, the things, the, the things that inevitably people also say, you know, make sure you're doing this because if suddenly you died and you hadn't talked to those people, those are things that weigh on me, I think. You know, there is a sort of like, oh my God, I haven't talked to so-and-so in so long and, you know, um, but when I'm at my computer and it would make sense to write a letter, it feels like invariably I'm just trying to get through something so I can walk away from the computer, if that makes sense. I don't, I, I don't even mean a handwritten okay. letter. I, so, yeah, so I mean an email. I guess I mean an email, but email, email yeah. means so many right. things BK. now. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. That, uh, that I, yeah, I sort of mean like a letter, like a yeah. conventional, like, Here's what's going on with me. I want to connect with you, and I want to tell you, you know, that I'm thinking about you, and feel like we're having this exchange where I feel caught up on whatever you're feeling at this moment, or whatever's been going on with you. Um, I don't feel like I'm I'm good at that at all. I, and I think if I had more time, I would feel like I, you know, that was something I would indulge more. Thank you very much. You're welcome. <laughs> yeah, my pleasure, Dana. Thank